project I have now since it's winter time is I want to tear this engine down. This is the engine off the Chinook. Uh, uh, the engine was probably made in 1994. It's what they call a gray head uh, Rotax 582. That's indicated by the color of the head down here. It's just gray color. It's not painted blue. Uh, it's, it's an old engine basically. Uh, but I've made some modifications to it and I need to uh, well I want to take it apart and see how bad it's it's worn if there's anything wrong with it I've I've done it several times I usually decarbon it about every oh, 350 400 hours I certainly wouldn't run one of these more than 600 hours or you'll probably have to put new pistons in it uh, but uh, I will say that this engine although it's really old it's done really well for me uh, I, I bought it, the engine first before I even built the Chinook. The, the engine I bought uh, used from a fella. It had about 640 hours on it, I guess, when I got it from him. Uh, the engine has an electric starter on it. It's got one of these what they call sidewinder type starters. But it's actually worked quite well for me. I've never had any trouble with this starter. It seems to work just fine. Uh, I have like I say some modifications that I did to this to fix certain problems that I I felt were pretty well documented that everybody had that problem and and I decided I I wanted to modify it and one in this video it'll be a series of videos probably because it'll take me a while to do this but uh, I'll show you what it is that I modified and the reasons I modified it uh, about this engine uh, the Chinook itself, my plane, I've had that for 20 years now, I guess it's 20, 20 21, so it's, it's, I've flown it for 20 years, and uh, I found it to be a pretty good, pretty good airframe, it, it's really strong and everything. Uh, this engine has pretty much done really well, any problems I've had with it have been caused by me, myself, uh, nothing that I can attribute to the engine itself, but like I say, I did make some modifications to it, and uh, I'll talk to you about that uh, in this video when I get this thing tore apart. These motor mounts are my own. These didn't come with the Chinook. There's, it's probably overkill. I've, you know, I've got four motor mounts on this bar here and just two on this bar. But uh, I got to thinking, boy, what if that, what if that engine come loose? Uh, or I lost a prop blade or something and it really got to shaking and I, I kept thinking, well, I don't want a you know, really weak motor mount on there. i got to have this thing mounted on there real well. So that's the reason it's kind of overkill on this mounting system, but uh, I just kind of scared myself, I guess, about it. Uh, there's modifications to the wiring here uh, that I made too, but uh, I just wanted to point out that I'm going to take this apart to see what it's like inside. I have another engine that I bought from a fella that only has 115 hours on it. And I've had several people tell me, well, why don't you just uh, use the other engine uh, entirely and put on there? But the other engine doesn't have these modifications. So I can modify the other engine. I can do that. And I might end up doing that. I'm not sure. What I start out with these videos saying I'm going to do, sometimes I change my mind before I get too far. But, uh, but anyways, uh, right now I'm just looking for, uh, mostly for wear, things that I think could be defective on it or, you know, just anything wrong with it. You know, you get play in a rod bearing or something like that, and something has to be done about that, because sooner or later this baby's going to go kerhoom, so... This engine has the original stuff on it. The only thing that I ever replaced was gaskets. When I'd take it apart, I'd put new gaskets in it. And uh, I think that as far as the engine parts and everything in here, I've, I've looked all over in there and I don't see any clock in there that uh, is telling me how many hours are on a part. What really counts is where and uh, the hours I don't think has that much to do with it. Some people run an engine harder than others. I, I don't run mine real hard most of the time when I'm flying on it. 
oh, one quarter to one third throttle. That's how far I have the throttle open. I don't, I don't run around full throttle much except on takeoff. That's the main time I do that. Or if I'm, you know, in a hurry to get somewhere or something, then I'll go faster. But in general, most of the time, I take it easy on it. It doesn't require that much, and you just burn a lot of gasoline to go. You know, if you want to go an extra 10 mile an hour faster, you know, it's going to cost you 50% more fuel. It just, it doesn't make sense on a high drag aircraft. So, uh, I usually take it easy as far as the throttle I give it. So anyways, uh, you can see this engine, it's not too heavy. I suppose I should get something to weigh it and see if I can find out how much the whole rig weighs. But I'll wait till I take the motor mounts off. That's probably how I should weigh it. So I might do that. Uh, this this uh, Sidewinder starter, I ran around with just that for a long time. It never gave me any problems. Uh, but I did, mostly because I changed the radiator on the back of the plane and that saved me some weight. I thought, well, since I saved weight, I can add some. And so I put a recoil starter on it. So on this end, I now have a recoil starter. Uh, on there and I've never used it never had to but I thought well in an emergency I can probably pull a recoil starter and start it if I had to but I've never had to but it's on there it used to be just a flat plate on there so other than that I don't think there's too much to tell you before I get started here other than the first step is going to be to drain the fluids out of the gearbox here I have to get the fluid out of there and there's undoubtedly some in the rotary valve oil. Uh, I'll have to figure a way to drain this oil out. It's this section between the two cylinders. There's a skew gear in here that runs the rotary valve and the water pump. And I want to drain the, the oil from that box. That's what these two rubber hoses, they go to a little reservoir that's mounted on the aircraft. But uh, I want to take and get that oil out of there because that'll give me a problem when I rolling it over and working on it and stuff. So if you want to know how one of these sign wider starters works, uh, there it is. You can see how the teeth are made. Uh, there's a stamping in there just kind of made out of eighth inch thick steel uh, pressing that they cut uh, gear teeth into and that's how the Bendix works. It's not mechanically correct but it works and it hasn't ever given me any problem. Uh, this red aluminum piece in here is an extension that allows me to use the uh, the pull starter, the rope pull starter, which is here. The other thing I think I'll show you is this is the drain plug from the gearbox and the magnet on it is absolutely clean so there's absolutely no metal shavings or anything like that in the gearbox. It's always something I want to check. Uh, see other than that I can also show you probably would be a good idea anyway to show you here the exhaust port as you can see is is plenty clean in there they don't really uh, carbon up like other two strokes might they're pretty pretty clean in there so uh, but that's that's just Rotaxes like that, uh, and I've seen the air-cooled ones look the same way. They they keep the exhaust port cool enough, I guess, that it doesn't uh, doesn't allow the carbon to stick to it. It just seems to blow right into the muffler. Once you take that housing off, this maybe makes it a little more clear how it works. Uh, whenever you do take the housing off, you want to worry about this bolt right here. Uh, that that bolt, the head of it, is inside. You, you can't get to it until you take the starter motor off and then you can see this particular bolt holding the housing on. Uh, just as a point of reference for people. Also, I thought I'd mention, here we go with these uh, JBM uh, sockets. As you can see outside of these things, they're not cracked they look like brand new and they've been on there for years uh, just thought I'd mention that these carb sockets really hold up the rubber they're made out of really really works good and they got the little locking rib in there and and uh, so they can't throw your carbs and 
Uh, I think if you can get a set of those, it's probably well worth doing. Now this this right here is a temperature sensor, and I've had to replace those before because I damaged the wires. Because being this is an inverted engine, I'm always working on it upside down. So uh, I really should have taken this out probably before I removed the uh, engine from the airframe. But uh, I'm going to take that out so I don't end up damaging it. You might also notice that I, I put these trailer connector things that you get at the auto parts store on. They fit pretty tight. And I put those on oh, most all my wires here uh, so that it's easy to, to take the engine off the airframe. I put a paint dot on there if there's anything where I think, well, I might get it confused with another one. Uh, this one has four wires going into it. You can get them up to six wires going in one of those. But I find that to be quite easy to connect and disconnect. Uh, some of this stuff is stuff that I added. Uh, for instance, this right here is a it's a fan switch uh, that came off a car. I'm thinking of some kind of Chrysler. I can't remember right offhand, but I test them in a bottle of water and uh, so that it, it, when it gets to about 180 degrees, uh, 190, something like that, uh, the switch closes and it lights a dash on the panel, or it puts a warning light on the panel, uh, sort of a car dash light on there, red idiot light I'll call it, uh, to warn me that the engine's getting close to the boiling point. And I'll explain more about that when I get into the water pump and stuff. But uh, anyways, I just put some shrink tubing on there. That's why it's yellow like that. But that's what that thing is. Now, I've had a couple of people ask me about the rotary valves. Uh, some two-stroke engines are what they call piston port. And they've got the carburetors going into the cylinder through a hole that would be up here. And the piston uncovers the port. And that's what is the valve, the intake and uh, controls the intake for the carburetor uh, is controlled by the piston and that's what they call piston port this one is what they call a rotary valve and as you turn it you can see that rotary valve it's just a whole thin piece of almost sheet metal it's not very thick and it turns and and cuts off the the intake in this manner and then as it keeps turning uh, the valve will rotate around and open like so. You see it opening. This is the direction it rotates. And that gives you asymmetric timing. You can cut that valve plate so that the port is open at a different time than it closes. Uh, not exactly even like it would be on the piston, which when it opens and closes is exactly the same position in crankshaft rotation it's an equal number of degrees and with a rotary valve and a little uh, asymmetric uh, inlet uh, it'll work a lot better at altitude than a piston port two-stroke will so two strokes are good where you got a lot of air pressure like down at sea level they work real well but when they get with altitude eh, they, they lose a lot of power they're spitting a lot of gas back out through the carburetor because the air just isn't heavy enough so that's what the rotary valve is all about. This is where the oil injection was on here, which I have taken off. And I'll explain why that is later. I told you I'd tell you a little bit more about this rotary valve and the, and the oil pump situation with, with this engine. Uh, this plate is a cover plate that I made that plugged up the port where the oil injection pump went. There was a little gear that goes through there and is driven off of this uh, shaft that runs the rotary valve. I call this a complex two-stroke engine because it has a rotary valve and the rotary valve is going at 90 degrees to the crankshaft. It's driven by a skew gear in between these two cylinders uh, that's on, mounted on the crankshaft right in the middle between the two, the two crank throws. So uh, what I did was eliminate that oil pump drive, and I'll kind of show you how that worked. But the other thing I thought I'd better tell you about is when, I, when you take off this uh, rotary valve cover here, you take out, there's four screws here, here, and here. 
uh, you're going to see uh, the rotary valve when you pull this cover off here. These screws are a little bit different lengths and it's important to have a screw of the right length because these holes aren't tapped any too deep and the worst ones are right here. If you put a, uh, a bolt in there that was too long it's going to hit against the outside of the cylinder and it'll bust this ear off of the off the casting when you tighten it up and that wouldn't be too good. But uh, anyways there was a uh, a little plastic gear that's driven by this spline on the end of this rotary valve shaft here. Uh, this thing here is a rotary valve which if I turn this thing you can see it moving. Uh, if you uh, really wanted to set the timing which you you probably would need to do if you take this rotary valve off which I am going to have to do you can stick, you should stick a wood stick in here, but I don't seem to have one in front of me, but I'll use this. Uh, it's just a Allen wrench. I'll stick in the spark plug hole. What you do is you, wrote the en you rotate the engine the way it rotates. I'm doing it on this rear cylinder here, which is a power takeoff one, is the one I'm sticking this wrench in. And you'll notice at, at top dead center, when you feel a piston, you know, you can feel where the piston's at by this Allen wrench. And when it gets to top dead center, right there is where that rotary valve should go on. It's just even with that top edge of that port. In other words, if the when the piston continues down, it's going to cover that port. It's ready to close that port. There's a little tiny O-ring seal here you got to keep in here with this for the rotary valve cover, but that's just used as a gasket. Uh, some people have said, well, this rotary valve, let me turn it a little bit here, it's just a, like a piece of a sheet metal. Uh, you know, what, what is it that holds that, the rotary valve, it, can ju it just sits on there and can move back and forth, but it's, it's the pressure in the crankcase that's pushing against this side of the rotary valve that holds it in contact with this face here and that's what seals it. That's why you get pressure in the crankcase. So it's it's uh, a pretty simple thing. It's not too complex. You'll, you'll understand it when you see it. But the main thing is uh, if you set, if you get this set with the the back cylinder and you got it right there at top dead center, which is right there, and you go to put this rotary valve thing back on there, there's only one one place it'll fit. If I try to to put it on someplace else, the spline the spline would be would be different. Like if it's at top dead center and I move it one spline, you can see how much that's off. The only other thing you could do wrong is if you flipped it over or something. I still don't think you could get it. I don't think that's going to go on there where you want it. It's still off. It's still not even with that edge. So there's only one way to put that on there and have it be in time. But uh, people, when they put them together, that's something they could do is uh, have this thing, you know, flipped upside down or something like that, so it's not just ready to cover that port. And of course. It's the same on the other port. If you put that at top dead center, then as the rotary valve come around, it would be at this bottom edge here, ready to close the port. So keep that in mind if you're putting this on there. Other people will make scribed lines. Looks like this one's got one on there right there, maybe. I, I see a little mark there that somebody must have put on there for something. But you'd have to have the engine in the right position to know what that's supposed to be for. Anyways. That's it for the rotary valve. <clears throat> but I did want to tell you about the oil pump on this engine and the reason I removed it. This is the reason for this modification. You'll notice the oil injection lines here. I got little plastic caps, little pieces of plastic uh, like sealed off tubing that close these. Uh, 
oil injector lines where the oil was being pumped into the engine at, at one time. And uh, the oil pump was removed, which under this cover, if you take these screws out, there was a plastic gear on that side of it that engaged the end of this spline right here. They're using this spline like a gear to drive the oil pump. But uh, to make a long story short, what happened is we found out that the oil pump didn't pump in the correct amount of oil. It wasn't pumping in 50 to 1. Uh, we couldn't get it to pump in any more than 70 to 1, which was the most we could get it to pump in, and that's with the the uh, cable adjustment blocked full open for full stroke on there. It's not really a pump. It's, I'd call it more of a metering valve than a pump. It, 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 it won't draw anything. It won't, you have to have the oil tank has to be mounted higher than this this thing they call a pump and uh, the oil has to flow in there and then there's a piston that takes a stroke and pushes a certain amount of oil into the engine for each revolution of this pump and that stroke that it takes varies in length so it could take a little bit longer stroke or a shorter stroke if it's at an idle it's just the pistons just barely move it in that pump a little bit just pumps in a little tiny bit of oil so uh, the way we found this out is the fellow that owned this engine that gave it to me, uh, he, we both flew together up to Putin Bay on a flight and we were comparing how much fuel we used and so forth. We we're flying side by side and uh, I see him putting some oil in his oil injector pump or you know in the tank on this thing and I, at that time this engine was mounted on a Quicksilver and I asked him, I said well uh, just exactly uh, how much oil did you use on this trip and he says oh I got it marked he was real careful with his calibrations and everything and uh, he told me that the, the amount of oil he used and I said well you know I I put in six gallons of gas here and that's one pint of oil you, you aren't you aren't using near the oil that I am not even close and I got a little 447 engine and uh, after that we got to kind of questioning just how much oil was he using and he starts keeping track of it and you know if you if you keep track of your fuel usage when you burn 50 gallons of fuel you should have used uh, one gallon of oil if you're running 50 to 1. Well after carefully calibrating and keeping track of it and really checking it close uh, we also uh, <clears throat> took apart the oil system, took all the oil lines off. He bought a new oil pump, new injector lines, new everything except for the, the tank, I think, was the only thing he didn't replace was the oil tank. We couldn't find anything wrong with it. I'd run the oil pump on the drill press downstairs, and I see how it works and everything. There really isn't anything to go wrong with it. So in my opinion, it never pumped in the right amount of oil to start with. I don't think. I can't, I can't understand how it ever could have worked right. Uh, but anyways, the most we could get it to, the most oil we could get it to pump in there was going to give you uh, 70 to 1. That's the, the most, the richest oil flow was 70 to 1. And most of the time he's getting, and that's, that's with us blocking the stroke full on all the time. It was just blocked open. And uh, anyways, a long story short was, and it was a long story I guess, but the main thing was that uh, it was pumping in 120 to 1, which is what he was basically averaging on his oil usage, is 120 to 1. And when you think about, you know, taking off all that water over there and stuff, when you take off, it's kind of dangerous I think to, to take off with an engine that's putting in oil that that weak a mixture of oil in there. Now they say these things that the crankshafts don't last very long and this one's lasted a real long time. In fact I don't see there's anything wrong with this engine. You can watch the last video that I made and I think you'll see that it was running fine. It, it sounds good and it runs fine. There's no knocking clunking or anything in here. You know when you turn the engine it, everything seems tight there's no play in anything. Uh, so I believe, and this is my opinion, and I'm sure that will make a lot of discussion, uh, my opinion, these things never pumped in enough 
oil on these 582s and that's probably why you get short crankshaft life and I would assume that you'd get short even shorter crankshaft light if it's mounted inverted like it, or I mean on the Chinook this thing was on a Quicksilver or it was upright and upside down the crankshaft's going to be on top and I would think that would be even worse for the crankshaft life so uh, anyways once we found that out we eliminated the oil pump and put on a uh, just mixing the just mix the oil and gas together so I know I'm getting 50 to 1 uh, yeah at an idle and at, at low throttle and stuff maybe it is putting in a little bit too much oil but as you can see it doesn't carbon up or anything it seems fairly clean and we'll, we'll look, check that when we take this head off but, but that is the reason for this modification of eliminating the oil injection entirely like I say the fellow bought two, two complete systems have been on there, oil injection systems, and they both did the same thing. So I kind of think that's the way it always run. And I've heard from other people that when they sit down and figure out how much uh, oil is going in for 50 gallons of gas, uh, they are not using a gallon of oil for 50 gallons of gas. It's not even close. So uh, I'd advise people to check it and see what they're using anyway. So that's the reason for that. And that's how you set the timing on the rotary valve. Uh, this fellow in the process of all this, I remember we were working on this oil injection. He sent this engine down someplace in Florida where they, they worked on it. And uh, when it came back, it wouldn't even run when it came back from them. And, and I, I asked him on the phone, well, look in the carburetors, you know, and tell me what this rotary valve is and you know set the pistons at a certain place and I'm talking to him over the phone and he said well both those holes are closed and I said well the rotary valve isn't set right so they didn't have this timed right when it came back from them so he was going to send it back to them to get them to fix it and I said well you know all we got to do is take this plate off and put it on there right so so that's what we did anyways that's just a point I'd like to make and I thought I ought to tell you the reason why this engine does not have oil injection and why I don't run oil injection. It has about 1400 hours on it, something like that. I think it runs pretty well. I've never put new pistons in it or rings or anything other than gaskets. I don't think I've really had to put any parts in it. 